Alright, so night three, we're going to hear more stories about Jesus. What are some things you remember that we've learned about Jesus so far this week? What are some things that we've learned about? Alright, Xander. Holy spit, you might have made a blind man see. Okay, so Pastor Patrick last night brought a message from John 9 about a man who received back his sight and got to see for the first time. Alright, someone else said something else they remember. Yeah. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. We covered that the first night with the video that I shared. And so Patrick's going to be talking more about that tomorrow. So what else have we learned about Jesus? That Jesus has always existed even before he was physically born. Yes. Do you want that? That'll blow your mind. But uh, John 1 and Colossians 1, that Jesus existed before even time began. So that's really crazy. What up, Nate? The church fair, recognized the miracle when they were when they didn't you know, the church that she recognized Okay, so the religious leaders, we're gonna deal in with this more tonight. The religious leaders, the people who are supposed to be the closest to God, were not able to see who Jesus really was and embrace it, right? They rejected it, which is one of the truths we're gonna look at. And I saw one other hand. Okay, yeah. I had Jesus promised he was born. Yes, Jesus was promised and was born. Okay, so those are some of the truths that we've been looking for. Um, one thing I wanted you guys not to miss, it kind of clicked for me today as I've been reading this passage and then also looking at the trajectory of VBS and kind of what they're talking about. They're talking about seek truth and finding Jesus. This idea of how can we not only see that Jesus is the truth, the light, the Savior that God has promised, but also some of the proofs that we know the Bible is true, that Christianity is true. And so one of the first nights, which you saw, is one of the reasons we know Christianity can be true is that Jesus was promised in the Old Testament, all of these old men who knew God, who did prophecies about the coming Messiah, and then he showed up, that, that God actually fulfilled that. And then the second night, we saw that there was a lot of promises that he would have the power of God, that he would bring healing, he would bring sight to the blind. Isaiah talks about that. And we see Jesus fulfilling those things. And then what we're going to see tonight is Jesus spends about three years of his life doing ministry, and then he gets to the end of his life, and he's getting ready to go to the cross. And these bad things happen to him. But the bad things that happened to him were actually things God and Jesus were knew were going to happen. And they were in control as they were happening. Jesus was not a savior king who was not in control and power, but these were happening to him and he was allowing it to happen. Okay? So what we're going to see tonight is that Jesus was betrayed and rejected by those that he had come to save and provide salvation for so if you all have your Bibles and you want to go to the main passage, it's going to be John 18. But before we get to John 18, I'm actually going to start in John 13. Because it's something very important that we need to understand. He says this. He says, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So Jesus knew that his hour had come. I did not put this verse on the screen, so Rob's correct. I did not put the verse on the screen. But I think it's interesting that Jesus knew that his hour had come. This was his last hours, his last week leading up to giving his life on the cross that Patrick's going to talk about tomorrow. But he says he loved them to the end, and he talks about the supper. And then it says this, after these, and verse 21 of 13, it says, After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly I say, you, one of you will betray me. So I think one of the things that we need to know about Jesus is that nothing really surprises Jesus. That Jesus is in control. He knew he was going to be betrayed. We can trust that what Jesus says is true. And we can also trust that when something happens in our life, that that didn't take God by surprise. That not only did he know what was going to happen here, but he knows for each one of us what the future is going to hold. And he says he's going to be betrayed. But I want to switch over to John 18, and I really just want to read through 18 through this whole account 
and just explain it to you guys to talk about this importance of Jesus going to be the Savior of the world, but then repeatedly being betrayed and rejected and receiving punishment for something he never did. So starting in 18.1, it says this. When Jesus had spoken these words, this is a kind of cool passage, but Jesus in John 17 prays for, for the disciples, but he also prays for you and me. He prays for us, those who might future believe in him. And he actually struggles, and he talks to God the Father, and he says, is there any other way? And God says, no. And he says, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be the Savior that you sent me to be. He was on mission, on a task. And so after these words had been spoken, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, and there was a garden in which he and his disciples entered, and then he was betrayed. But verse 4 says, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, he knew what was going to happen to him. He was in control. Verse 12, there's, well, actually, to explain the passage, he's betrayed, for those of us who haven't read this story before, by someone who he had spent three years of ministry plus with. And he was sold out for money because they wanted to kill him. Because the religious leaders wanted their authority, they wanted the people of God back. But they said, Jesus is troublemaker. Jesus is too powerful. Jesus has this ability from God. And it's taking away our authority and power. And we want him gone. And so they worked this way to have him betrayed. And then he's taken. He hands himself over to be the savior of the world. In verse 12, he says, So the band of soldiers and their captain and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And first they led him to Annas, for, the, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. You see, the religious leaders had pictured Jesus as someone who was causing trouble. And they said, if he continues to cause trouble, and he calls himself the king of the Jews, and he calls himself a ruler of a kingdom, which is what we believe, and we're going to see in a few moments, then Rome is going to come, and they're going to punish us. And the Jewish leaders were like, not only do we want our authority back, but we want this guy gone. And so we're going to paint him in a light that's not good. I forget which passage I put up next, Rob. I skipped from 14 to what? 19? Yeah. John 19. Is it 25? 28. 28. Okay, cool. So, I have summarized this. So Jesus is taken into custody. There's a part about Peter denying him. But then he goes before all these religious leaders because he did nothing wrong. But he took this punishment for you and for me because he was going to the cross and he's going through the process. And so he goes to the high priest and then he ends up going to Pilate. And that's what I really want us to focus on. It says, then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters to Pilate. And it was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him to you. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. So this man, Pilate already was like, I don't want to deal with this. This man is not deserving of death. And they're like, but, but we want to kill him. They said this, they said, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And then it says, this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. I forgot to look it up, but again and again and again, both the book of John and the book of Matthew in the Bible talk about things like this happening. And then it says, this was to fulfill. Does anyone want to guess what that means in the Bible when it says, this was to fulfill? What should we think about when we see that? So I'll go back here first. To complete. Or... So to complete, to bring about, that's what it means. Also, yeah. It was, they were trying to prophecy to the Old Testament. And then Jesus spoke about his death. So to show that he was the ultimate savior, he decided to fulfill. Yeah. It also gives a Bible passage. Okay. So it's a key in. So Brooklyn's 
dead on. It's a key into how accurate and truthful the Bible is. Because it's a reference. It says, this was to fulfill. This is saying there was someone, there was a prophecy back in the Old Testament. Or something that was spoken by Jesus where he says, I'm going to come and die. And this is going to happen to me. It's one of the texts that gives us an idea of, hey, the Bible promised this was going to happen. And then God showed who he really was. But it says, this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters, this main man who was ruling the Roman Empire, and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? There's a power struggle here. There's this idea of king. Obviously, the religious leaders had said, this guy claims to be the kings of the Jews. And Pilate was working for a king who would be threatened by this new king and his kingdom. And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting and I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Jesus, in perfect control, talks about the heavenly kingdom. The kingdom that we believe in Christianity is to come. But it also involves us now. That we don't see him physically ruling and reigning now, here on earth. But we know that he will one day. And that he is in control, even now. He says, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am king, for this purpose I was born. So he testifies that he's in control, that God's working these things for a reason. I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? It says, after this had happened, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you of Passover. So do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they cried again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. It's not in this text, but there's other gospels that talk about Barabbas more importantly. But this was a man who deserved punishment. And the religious leaders were so blinded by the fact they wanted Jesus killed that they would rather have someone who was guilty of sin and deserving of death, released instead of Jesus. What's unique about this experience, though, is all of us, the Bible teaches, there are none without sin, none righteous, no, not one, except for Jesus. All of us have the opportunity, because of what Jesus is getting ready to do on the cross, to be the one who has sinned, guilty, deserving of death, and gets set free. When we see this man, Barabbas, who was deserving of death, we should see somewhat of a picture of you and me. That without Jesus' intervention, we are on a road towards eternal separation from God. But then Jesus did something miraculous that Patrick's going to talk about tomorrow. But in this moment, they say, we want Barabbas. We don't want Jesus. We want Barabbas. We want the guy who's deserving of death. We want Jesus to die because that serves our purposes. 19.1, it says, Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. It means he beat him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again to see them. See, I'm bringing you him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Pilate was hopeful that by beating Jesus and humiliating him that the Pharisees would leave him be. That by beating him and punishing him, they actually wouldn't make Pilate, or make Pilate kill him. But that wouldn't have fulfilled God's purposes. And so the Pharisees continue to be hard-hearted. It says, So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. 
When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Pilate wanted nothing to do with this. But Pilate got to be a tool in God's hand to fulfill his purposes. It says, The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. This for the Jews was blasphemy. It was an idea of saying, Jesus saying, I'm equal with God. And that was a problem for them. Because what we already heard Patrick talk about last night, what did he talk about Jesus' power? Where did it come from? God. And what was Jesus equal to as a part of the Trinity? God. So was Jesus wrong to say that he was the Son of God? So they're saying, what he claims to be the Son of God and he's deserving of death for that, was he deserving of death? No. No. It says, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. I was curious about this, so I looked it up. Does anyone know why Pilate would have been afraid because Jesus was the Son of God? Because of what? You could kill him? Mm, maybe. Brooklyn. Maybe it's because if he probably was a Roman, he didn't believe like yeah. exactly what he was believed, but he still probably, since he lived in their city, he had their culture, and he knew that their God was very powerful because he had done things like heart surrender and things like that. So he probably didn't believe that God was very powerful. He had done things like heart surrender and he had the whole city of Jericho. Yeah. So he probably believed that if he killed the son of God, that that could bring punishment on his head. There's other texts that point out one of the other reasons is Herod's or uh, Pilate's wife had had a dream and she was troubled about Jesus. So that's one reason. But that you're dead. On, you're on to what the point is. Okay, go ahead. What do you think? Because he has more power than him. And is, yeah, is Jesus all powerful? Does Jesus have all authority? So. This is Study Bible, so if you all have any questions about your Bible, I just encourage you to ask someone, search answers. This is pretty cool. This one I dug up today because I was wondering, why is Pilate afraid? Pilate was afraid because even the Greeks and the Romans yeah. believed that gods had, there was a certain divine qualities that could be in humans, which we don't believe as Christians. But this son of God concept means that he was a special human. And Pilate's like, I'm going to get in big trouble for what's going to happen here. And so he wanted to he wanted to not only wash his hands of the situation, but he didn't want to touch Jesus. But the religious leaders kept pushing him. But Pilate was curious. He says he was afraid. So he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus. So he wanted to talk to Jesus. He wanted to see if this was actually true. And Jesus said, to, and so, so Pilate said to him, um, Oh, yeah, nine. He entered his headquarters and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? And he says that as a question. He says, Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Pilate here says, I have the authority to kill you. Will you not answer me? What does Jesus say? Jesus answered, verse 11. Look at this power play, this amazing statement by Jesus. So Jesus answered him, you would have no authority. This is the guy who could kill people with one word, and all of his soldiers would kill them. He says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Jesus pulls a power play. He's receiving this punishment and he says the only authority that Pilate has is because God allowed him to be an authority. Because it was a part of his plan for him to go to the cross. So 12. From then on Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out if you release this man you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, 
he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Arabic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of Passover. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. He was making it very clear. They were the ones who were sending Jesus to the cross. They were the ones who he was killing, he died for. But it was also their king. It says, They cried, Away with him, away with him, and crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So here's what I want us to see. We just read the entire flock of scripture. We see that Jesus was not only betrayed, sold out by those who loved him, he was also arrested, and then he's going to go to die on the cross. But whose plan was that? It was ultimately God's plan. And why did he go to the cross? Yeah? For sin? For sin? Yeah? He went to the cross to restore a relationship with God. And Pat is going to talk more about tomorrow. But before we go through this, to keep with this truth theme and pointing it out, you see all the suffering, betrayal, that Jesus was in control, that what, this was God's plan. If we flip back to Isaiah 53, we're going to see that 500 years before this event took place, here's what Isaiah said about this moment. He said, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then in verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that was before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This was God's plan. It was his plan for Jesus to bear this betrayal and this rejection for you and for me. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for these students, for our time together. As we prepare for the message that Patrick's going to bring tomorrow about you going to the cross for the sin that separates us from God, and then what you did after the cross, I pray that we would be ready to receive it. I pray that we would see clearly that what happened from Jesus being betrayed by Judas to being killed by the Romans, being crucified as being the king of the Jews was not a surprise to him. It was part of his design. It was part of his plan. Because he wanted us to have the opportunity of having an eternal relationship with God. So you be among us this, tonight as we learn more about you. May we know that you did this for us because of your love for us. And nothing took you by surprise. May you be among us tonight in your name. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. All God's people said? Amen. Amen.